Pratik, welcome. Thank you for being with me for this interview. I've heard so much of you and I read a book which in part was co-authored by you as I have learned. And I'm really longing to know more about what you're doing and how your path is. Would you please like to tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Okay, yes. Well, I guess I'm, I'm best known for the uh, Sekhem. Mm -hmm. And Sekhem was something that I, you might say, discovered, oh gosh, I've been doing it for 40 years now. Wow. And... Um, Basically, what happened was is that as an architect, I uh, was very much interested in sacred geometries. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, as far as buildings goes, and the, the pyramids. So, so one of the my goals was is to learn more about the structures and how basically physical structures could help uh, in meditation, in healing, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time, I was doing an apprenticeship down in Florida, and I met a guy named Patrick Flanagan. Oh. Um, and I don't know, he, you have to be kind of old to know Patrick, but Patrick uh, was one of the first kind of people that really introduced uh, the pyramid energy and that sort of thing, really kind of popularized it a lot more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, bought a pyramid from him, you know, to sleep in and all this. And, uh, and so I really did a lot of studying with the pyramids and eventually I was a Peace Corps volunteer oh. uh, in, um, in Yemen. Um, and during my vacation, uh, first place I wanted to go was Egypt. So uh, this was back in 1980. Mm -hmm. And my idea was, was to spend the night in the pyramid. Wow, what a wonderful treat. And uh, so, you know, being a Peace Corps volunteer, I didn't have a lot of money. I didn't know how in the world I would do it. Um, now, I did pay the 20, like $20 to climb to the top of the pyramid <laughs> at the time. So that, that, that was on my list. I climbed to the top, did a little meditation on top of the pyramid. Uh, so, okay, now. So what happened was, is I went into the pyramid. And um, right before I went into the king's chamber, it was kind of like this feeling to look look down and there was this door mm -hmm. and i knew what the passage was it was like a little tunnel that the thieves had tried to carve to get up over the granite walls to come into the king's chamber mm -hmm. but it's a dead-end passage mm -hmm. and they had a gate on it with a little lock mm -hmm. and um the lock was not locked oh so um, I said, I'm coming back prepared tomorrow. If it's still not locked, I'm going in. <laughs> so I came back the next day. The lock wasn't locked. Uh, I had a little time by myself and I just crawled in the tunnel and I meditated there all day and they locked me in at night. Oof. So I had the whole place to myself. <laughs> Uh, you know, so I got in the king's chamber, uh, was meditating, mm -hmm. and I, I do this specific meditation working with sound, mm -hmm. kind of an inner sound. Mm -hmm. So I was sitting there meditating, all of a sudden, um, I heard this sound kind of really quick. It's like usually it takes me a while to get focused, but this was like really quick. Oh, wow, that's this things are happening quick here. I mean, uh, relax a little bit and the sound was getting louder and louder. And then I realized that it was mosquitoes. No. And I'm thinking, mosquitoes aren't supposed to be in the king's chamber. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm like, oh gosh, I, I, I really don't like meditating with mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know at the higher level of meditations, you, they don't bother you, but I wasn't there yet. So I said, what am I going to do? And the only thing that I had available, I didn't bring any repellent or anything. All I had was a roll of toilet paper. Okay. So I wrapped myself up in the toilet paper to keep the mosquitoes. Oh. <laughs> Sitting in the sarcophagus. <laughs> so I got all wrapped up in the toilet paper. And then I had a white robe on too. <laughs> and... Uh, 
And then uh, I said, I'm just going to lay down in the sarcophagus. And I lay down in the sarcophagus. And I don't know if you've ever been in the, in the king's chamber, but the, the sarcophagus is like a, a, a bell. Like you can, it's stone, but if you hit it, boom. And the king's chamber itself is like perfect acoustics. Like if, it, you know, if you ever do want to record your voice, it like has this amazing resonance. And so anyway, I lay down and then all of a sudden I start hearing these footsteps. And I'm going, oh no, people are coming up. And here I am lying in the sarcophagus. You know, I'm gonna get caught. And uh, like, what do I do? And you know, it's pitch black. Yeah, you know. And of course my mind is going like, okay, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? People are coming and I'm listening to hear this boom, boom, boom. You could hear the step here, come up the steps. And then I'm thinking, If there's people, they would turn the lights on. Right. Yes. You know, nobody turned the lights on. Mm -hmm. And I'm listening. It's getting closer. No, wait, it's not a person. Okay. And then what? It's not people. What is it? You know, like, you know, maybe it's bats. Maybe it's this. And then whatever it was, I felt it coming into the king's chamber with me. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm like, like, oh, oh, you know, okay, well. Be prepared. This is what you came here for, you know. And I can and, and I can actually like hear this presence walking towards me. And then the, it was like uh, lights started. Um, you know, and and I and my fear. I really started going into fear about it. Yes, I understand and, that. And um, you know, and really, I thought, okay. You I could die. Now, fortunately, I prepared myself. You know, I had read, you know, that uh, Napoleon had gone there and had a really frightening experience. Um, they say Jesus went in. I don't know if that's true, but you know, that the uh, uh, and then there is a book about initiation um, that I read many, many years ago. So I knew that this fear was part of the process. So my mind kind of came in, to be aware. So I just said, okay. Whatever it is, I'm just going to let it happen. Mm -hmm. And then I relaxed. And as soon as I relaxed, it's like this energy just kind of came in and it focused right in on my heart. And then for that brief moment, I realized that the sound was my heartbeat. Oh. Oh, how lovely. But the energy was amazing. Just, I, I kind of got into this amazing energetic experience and I stayed there all night. It was just like I went into a timeless state and, um, and I fortunately I put my watch on to ring at a certain time and before I knew it, 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 it was just like it rang and I was just like in this wave, in this sea of energy, it was incredible. Um, probably one of the larger experiences that I had ever had. Up to that point, because mm -hmm. since then I've had bigger experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went back and I went back to my hiding place. People came and went. Uh, and then I figured after about the third or fourth tour group that came in, I would just kind of sneak out with them. And so I did that. <laughs> and as I was going out, the guards started yelling at me and everything, because I'm sure they didn't recognize me going in. Um, and I just, you know, I could speak a bit of Arabic, so I knew what they were saying to me. And I just kept going. I just got out and I hopped on the first bus and went back to my hotel. And when I went back, I looked in the mirror and I was completely white. I had a, I had a long beard at the time. Okay. Yeah. And everything was just white. No. Turned uh, within the light? And, and, uh, it, it was a dust, a very white dust that just completely covered me. Okay. And now there's a history. There's supposed to be a history about this white dust. Mm -hmm. um, they call it Ormus. I don't know if you've, you've heard of Ormus before. But the idea is, is they use this Ormus to move the stones. Uh-huh. 
um, it kind of has a levitation type property. And if you eat it, mm-hmm. it kind of gives you a deep state of meditation. Oh, okay. So I don't know. Maybe there was this combination with the energy of the pyramid and everything. But anyway, um, <laughs> it was funny because it was just so like, ne- and then I realized why the guards were yelling at me. And then I uh, just decided to go into the old city and went to the mosque. And I met this, and this lady comes up to me and she says, can you help me find this Sufi ship? And uh, I said, okay. So I asked around, we found this uh, Sufi center. And before I knew it, um, they gave me an airplane ticket to go down to Sudan to meet this guy. Uh, they, they just gave you an airplane ticket? Yes. Wow. And the reason was, is because I had a dream. Okay. And I described what was happening Mm -hmm. in Sudan, in the dream. I said, they're building this building. And they talked about the building and they just said, oh my gosh, you got to go. And uh, so I went down, I met the Sheikh and he did kind of, we did kind of, um, it it was kind of an initiation with the Sufi work. Um, And he gave me a mantra, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't think much of it, you know, I just thought it was a nice experience, but um, at the time, I just wasn't really prepared to receive what, what was being told to me and everything. And, but I followed the meditation, and the meditation was uh, just repeat the words Allah, 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 and I didn't think anything much about it, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody knows Allah, you know, you speak Allah. And, but what happened was, is that as I was repeating these words, um, Allah, it became all love. Yeah. And and then as I repeated the word all love, then the heart started to open more. And as you know, with the Sufi religion, they're very heart centered. Yes, yeah, much. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, so the the focus really started coming in on the heart more. So what I felt was happening was is that I just had this amazing experience in the pyramid. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm with the energy. And then I connected to an Egyptian mm-hmm. who had the roots going all the way back to Egypt. He was, he was Nubian. And if you know anything about the Nubians, they're kind of the last culture in Egypt that still speaks some of the old language. Okay. And I really feel, it's just my opinion, but I really feel a lot of the Sufi traditions mm-hmm. are kind of a cover so that they can practice those those things in Islam. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, you're right. You know, it's a little bit like some of the, um, the Christian, you know, charismatic Christians where they're working with energy and stuff like that. Um, they really have deep roots working with the energy, but because they're doing it within the Christian framework, they're accepted. Yes. And that's how I f- feel about the Sufis is, is they're still working like in these old... Mm-hmm these old energies, mm-hmm. but they're now accepted into the Islam to some degree. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it's rather interesting because the, after the guy, after I met him, he, he died a year later. And then the year after that, I went back. Uh, one of the lady I met, she actually came to the United States and says, they want you to come back, they want you to come back. And um, when I went back to see him, a lot of the, one of the old late elders came up to me and he says, what did the Sheikh give to you? you know, what did he give to you? And I said, well, what do you mean? And actually I was a little disappointed because he, everybody got a, a mala, a string of mala. He didn't give that to me. Mm-hmm. You know, I said, well, they didn't give me anything. They said, no, no, no. What was the mantra he gave you? Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, he just gave me all up. No big deal. And the guy looked at me and goes, no, that's not possible. He says, nobody, nobody gives you the mantra Allah. Mm-hmm. And uh, why not? You know, to me, it's one of the most common Muslim words, <laughs> you know. And um, he says, look, he says, what happens is the Sheikh gives a mantra, usually like Bismillah, Arman, Arahim, it's a little more complex. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then he says, after years and years and years, maybe 20 years worth of meditation, the final mantra that they give you is Allah. Really? Yeah. Wow. What a blessing. And so he looks at me and he says, he wants you to be a sheikh. 
you you and they want then they they were trying to convince me to be kind of to become a, a sheikh and to teach mm-hmm. you know because the the the, the mantra they gave yeah sure. and i kind of no <laughs> um i like i mean islam has a lot of beautiful things but there's yeah. Some things that I, I really can't accept. I don't like the way they treat the women. Sort of. Yeah, no, no way. And actually, this this goes back to an interesting story with the sheikh. Mm-hmm. Um, he did tell me a lot of interesting stories and things like that. A lot of them I thought were just a lot of myths. But one night, I was uh, waiting for him to come over, and he they do a Sufi dance like on Thursday nights, and I was just kind of waiting for him to come over. He didn't come and I'm sitting in my bed and all of a sudden he walks up to me Mm -hmm. and he says, Patrick, you really need to become a Muslim. (laughs) And I just looked at him and I said, well, I said, again, just like I already said, there's a lot of beautiful things in Islam, but there's a lot of things. I just wouldn't be a good Muslim. Mm -hmm. Um, um, And he looks at me and he goes, okay, I understand. And I just kind of looked away and I looked back and he was gone. And he's an old guy, he's an old man, you know. It's like, where'd he go? And I get up and I look all over the place. And um, I asked, I said, where's the sheikh? And they said, well, he didn't come. I said, no, I was just talking to him. We had a little con- very nice conversation, in fact. He said, no, 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 he's at his house, he never came. And I'm going, what? So I went over to his house and they have a caretaker. And I said, is the Sheikh home? He goes, yes. He says, uh, did he leave? He says, no, no, he's been in his room all afternoon. He's not feeling well. And so I said, can I go talk to him? And now he's Sudanese. He's black, mm-hmm. very black. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you've got different degrees of black. And in the Sudan, they're very, very black. Mm-hmm. Um, Nubian. And, um, they love to wear the white turbans and the robes. And so I walk in and he's laying on his bed and all I could see was the whites of his eyes. Mm-hmm. And I walked over to him and then, uh, he looks up at me and he goes, he, they called me Abdullah. And he said, Abdullah, he says, mm-hmm. he says, you know, he says, you really need to become Muslim. And I just looked at him and I said, I know, we just had the conversation. <laughs> and then I saw this big, big smile. <laughs> but this guy was famous for this. Mm-hmm. He would show up in your dreams. He'd come, he would come visit me in my dreams sometimes. And um, so in a way, what happened was, is that I, it, it, this whole pyramid experience, Sufi experience kind of really changed things. And, um, I started having these out-of-body experiences all the time, uh, awakened dreams. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I decided I would do another two years volunteer in Nepal. In Nepal you have been? Oh! I spent two years on the top of a mountain. Mm. And my job was to put in a drinking water system. <laughs> but things go very slow there. <laughs> really? I, I oh, yeah. thought they are very structured and disciplined. <laughs> no, 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 no. So like, uh, like uh, every hour I'd go up and I'd make sure that they were doing the pipeline, making sure they, the water runs down the hill and everything. It's a water system we were putting in. And so basically I spent two years meditating up in the Himalayas in this little village. And, um, and again, just just having some deep experiences uh, with the meditation. Um, eventually, I kind of even met a, a Baba up there. It was really disappointing because I didn't really meet, a, I would say, a, a lot of um, spiritual people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, they had their priests and stuff like that, and you'd meet them, but you knew that they, it was just kind of a ritual stuff that they did. Mm-hmm. And I really thought that, oh, I've got to meet, meet some Babaji or something like that. And then I did, I met this guy and he lived, he lived uh, up on top of another mountain. Mm-hmm. And um, 
he, he just lived there for 10 years and uh, uh, we had a good connection. Uh, and he actually wanted me to stay there with him. But I ended up getting uh, amoeba and sick and I had to leave, so I couldn't, I couldn't stay there. But I went back and then I started taking uh, some massage courses. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started then to um, understand some of the stuff that was happening to me. Mm -hmm. And when we, when we would um, uh, do the massage, I noticed that, that there's this vibration coming. Mm -hmm. Now, when I would meditate, I would get this vibration. Now, I didn't really have a teacher about it. And at first, when this vibration started happening, I thought of it as maybe, you know, something, oh, maybe I'm getting sick, maybe I'm, you know, getting Parkinson's or something like that, you know, because it's this waves and vibration coming in. But then I started seeing it happening to the people that I was working with. Oh, okay. And I thought, wow, something going on here. And um, I always thought that the meditation was something that, um, you know, would be just personal, mm -hmm. you know, the whole idea of initiations and Shakti Pot, this sort of thing, I didn't get yet. Mm -hmm. um, um, I did end up taking a Vipassana course with Goenka. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I didn't even know who he was. I just showed up to the course. <laughs> And for those of you that are know Vipassana, you know Goenka is like the main, you know, he's like uh, Asui is to Reiki, Vipassana is, is to Goenka. And, um, and then I learned how to do the, the Vipassana type style meditation, which really kind of helped, helped keep, keep me in my body more. Um, and then I eventually went back to the US, but um, I got interested in this energy stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I went out to, uh, I found a little school where it looked interesting. They did a lot of hypnotherapy. You could get a massage certification, um, but it included a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. um, so I went out there and they did a clinic for the massage, but I ended up doing the energy work. Okay. And it really, really taught me a lot about it, but I didn't really have a name for what I was doing. And then eventually I, while doing that, I worked on somebody who did Reiki and they said, Oh, you know, this is amazing. You know, they said, you know, um, let's do an exchange. And so she did an exchange with Reiki mm -hmm. and, um, and I thought, well, you know, maybe this is something that I need to learn. Mm -hmm. And this was back in 1984. I see. And, um, I, I don't know if you're aware of it, but well, I'm sure you're aware of it. Back in 1984, if you wanted to be a Reiki master, it's $10,000. Yeah, lots of money. I paid it. Yeah. And um, so I took the first few Reiki courses, and it was interesting. Um, I did mine with Barbara Ray. I was trying to decide. I couldn't decide whether to do it with Barbara or do it with Phyllis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when I talked to Phyllis, she was kind of like, Oh, it doesn't matter who you teach it with, who you do it with. And, and Barbara was kind of like, my way is the best way, la, 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 la. And, I, and, and, uh, and, uh, and so I kind of, it, it, and also Barbara broke her mastership down into two parts. Yeah. And so I could only afford half part anyway. So I just, okay, I'll do the, I'll do the first part. And, uh, you know, she starts talking about the symbols. And now I just came from Nepal. And of course, you're talking about the, the story with uh, uh, Mikawa Sui meditating and receiving the symbols. Mm -hmm. And now she said they're Sanskrit. No. No, oh. I know. I, I studied Sanskrit. I was in Nepal, I learned. Sanskrit, and I'm looking at them and going, wait a minute, did I just spend $5,000 and be told that these are Sanskrit symbols? Oh, come on. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And, oh, it was a mess. You know, it was like that, that started it. And, um, and then there's the payment, you know, some lady, she didn't get the cashier's check. And so they had, she, and so she talked about the payment and how 
important the payment was for most of the class. And I'm kind of like, here I am, a Peace Corps volunteer, you know, the money wasn't a big issue for me. And here she did, it was like money, 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 money. And it just turned me off. And I just, so I, I, I kind of got that first part of the mastership. I said, no, I'm not going to follow through with this. Hmm. But it was interesting. Um, I, I um, uh, continued working. And one of the things I did learn, of course, was the initiation process. Mm -hmm. And so I said, what if I start to work with the energy that I'm working with and just kind of work with the, the initiations? Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, some amazing things started happening too. I mean, a Reiki was amazing anyway, and, it, but, and, and then it was like something else was happening with it. And uh, I had a friend who did a lot of channeling, and her name was Christine Gerber, and we got together, and she kind of was very helpful. Um, but basically, she, she says, no, 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 you're, you're doing some Egyptian type of thing, you know? And it was like, how did you know that I was doing some kind of Egyptian thing, you know? <laughs> Uh, you know, she, she kept telling me all these things, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, you know, I did. I had this big initiation in Egypt. I met this Egyptian who did this, this Sufi initiation on me. You know, how do you know all this? And, um, and so she's a very good channeler. And she says, well, this is what you're channeling, you know. And so um, I didn't really have a name for it. So I went back, I meditated. And the name Sekim came very loud, very clear. So it's okay. We'll call it Sekim. And um, I started teaching, and after a while, a guy who wanted to, he, he knew that I had done the um, first part of the Masters with uh, Barbara Ray, he came, he wanted to learn a little Reiki, and I said, yeah, here's a little Reiki, we'll show you what, what, uh, what she taught me. And I said, but if you want to, I'll do this thing called Sekim. And um, so we did that, and he was like, oh, wow. <laughs> and, uh, and so... He started calling it Renegade Reiki. <laughs> renegade Reiki, that's a cool name. I yeah, like Renegade it. Reiki, because yeah. really, I don't know for sure. Maybe somebody else was doing it at the time. Mm -hmm. But it was the first time we didn't charge $10,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know, I, I actually did it by donation. I said, just give me what a reward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? And... Um, and it just spread. It's called Renegade Reiki. So uh, he taught it, and then um, and then you know we started. You, you know we we did use the word Sekim, and then a, a beautiful little woman named Phoenix Summerfield, she started teaching the Sekim in a lot of um, expos. Uh, one of her students taught Kathleen Milner, and uh, of course it it just started to spread, spread all over the world. Um, and so it was like, uh, in a way, wherever Reiki went, the Sekem went, because they, they worked so well together. And the book you read, the book, the book, the book you read. Uh, and really, you know, the Sekem has the Reiki in it. You can't separate the energy. And mm -hmm. I don't really even like the name, name energy, you know, because as soon as you give it a name, you start to limit it. You go, oh, that's Reiki. And then you think, this is what Reiki is in my mind. So this is... Um, this is what to expect. Yeah. And, then, and, then, and then with that expectation, you put the limitations on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, I really don't even like to use the, the, the labels and the names and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, it, uh, it really spread and it grew all over the world. And um, this was all before the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and then one day uh, I was doing a class and this lady comes up. She says, hey, they're talking about sick him. Uh, on, online. And I said, what? You know? And, uh, and actually, I was pretty good with the computer, so I was doing a lot of 3D stuff. But um, I, I never got online. I never got into those chat rooms or anything like that. And uh, so she says, yeah, yeah, it's easy. You just get one of those AOL discs. Remember the AOL? <laughs> with the modem thing. Rah, 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 rah. So I got in. I got into this Reiki chat group, and they're talking about Sick Kim. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I said, oh, hi, everybody. I'm Patrick. And Patrick? 
Who's Patrick? You know, and I say, oh, Patrick, you're Patrick. Oh, you're the one that started the same kid, you know? And it was interesting because half the group loved me, half the group hated me. <laughs> what? Why is that? Why is that? Haven't you run against that yet? Haven't you? Well, that yeah. people who, who hate you? Polarizing people all the time, you know? Oh, man. Well, what happened was, is that, you know, some people thought that I was a joke, you know, that, no, 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 you're not the real Patrick, you know, you're, fa you're fake, you're pretending to be. And, um, and so uh, what happened was, in the group, there were a couple people who were planning to write the first second book. Okay. Without you? And, and without me, yeah. Okay. And, and, uh, and so when I showed up, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, and it, it kind of <laughs> exists. <laughs> <laughs> but that's when I started this uh, one year online class. I mean, you know, we used the telephone. Yeah. I shouldn't say online, but we did a one year, one year course with it. And, and we had a really good group. And then through that, the All Love book was written. Uh, Diane Shoemaker, that was the book yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. you read. Mm -hmm. um, but what she was doing, though, is, is that she did what she called Sekim Sekim Reiki. And so um, she really continued to teach the Reiki with, with the Sekim and, and used it kind of, she called it kind of like a, you know, a family, you know, so okay. um, uh, working with the energies all together. Mm -hmm. um, and worked with what I call the, the Reiki template. And I, the, the, the Reiki template, in my opinion, would be using the initiations, using the symbols and this sort of thing. Yeah. And if you notice, most of the people, many of the people who are not connected with me that teach the Sikkim, they still use that. It's, a, it's like what they've done is they've done the Reiki uh, and then they just change the symbols. Okay. And then they say, then it's second. Okay. What, what, what puzzled me when I was reading that book is that there were people mentioned in Australia and other places in the world who contributed to the system. Yes. And this and channeled that, but I couldn't really understand what they did. No. Well, basically, you see, what was happening is, is that everybody who would add a symbol to it, uh, they would claim that they were, that they, they were the founder. Ah, oh, okay. Gosh. It, it's, it, it would be a little bit like um, you or William mm -hmm. saying you introduced Reiki. Oh gosh, no. <laughs> because you added a new symbol to Reiki or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. But, yeah. You know, no, you guys didn't do that. You know, no. William added some symbols and he says it's Karuna Reiki. And you and you do your work and you call it rainbow Reiki. You're not claiming that you introduced Reiki, but what people were doing with the Sekim is, is that some of them were actually claiming that they introduced the Sekim because they added these symbols to it. Gosh. It was crazy. <laughs> and so this is one of the reasons why so there was this big polarization. And a lot of that happened because I told the teachers, I said, don't get into this lineage stuff. I don't want to get involved in the lineage. Just teach it. Get out and teach it. That's what's important. You don't want to make it about me or, you know, being some grandmaster or anything like that. I really wanted to keep away from that. Mm -hmm. And it totally backfired. Yeah. Because, hey, a, a big lesson, it taught me a big lesson. Hey, if you don't stand up, if, if, if you're not the one that, uh, that says, hey, I'm the, I'm the founder, somebody else will. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, some amazing stories started to come up. I mean, I saw people that are teaching say Kim, they said, oh yeah, I went to the Himalayas, I studied with a, uh, a sadhu up in the mountains and I learned the say Kim. And, uh, and it's like, come on, man, you know, we know that's not true, you know? And, um, one lady, she was saying, oh, I had these memories of the past, um, being a priest in Egypt at the time, and now I'm introducing the Sikkim. It's like all these stories started to come out, you know, because I didn't write the book and I wasn't advertising worldwide and things like that. This That's craziness crazy. started to happen. 
Yeah, yeah. And well, I mean, look, the same thing almost happened to Reiki. You know, what was it uh, from uh, Phyllis tried to trademark the name Reiki at one time? Yes, he did, yes. Yeah, you know, it's like after it's already out, people are using it, say, so, okay, I want to own it now. Mm -hmm. And actually, the same thing happened to Sekem. A lady uh, in Australia trademarked the name Sekem. Really? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, and I wrote to her and I said, wait a minute, um, didn't you learn Sekem from Phoenix? You know, one of my teachers, you know? <laughs> No, it, it, yeah, I tell you, this has been such an amazing experience. We learned so much about people. <laughs> yes, yes. And I'm sure you've been through it too. I noticed one, in one of your post ones, you're talking, somebody was giving you a hard time about being a grandmaster or something like that, you know? It, it happens, it happens all the time. But you know, um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working on my things then and try to, to, uh, make clear what the structures are in which I work. But yes. I think this will happen again and again because it's human, you know, people need sure. to you with the ego and ego needs to come up to be dealt with, you know, so. It's, it's yeah, it's really all part of the process. Yeah. It's yeah. really all part of the process, you know, and uh, do, people do talk about ego a lot, you know, it's like, uh, I had a very interesting experience about this ego. Oh, tell me. Um, well, uh, I was working in um, uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Okay. And they, they, uh, I got a phone call. And the guy calls me and he says, oh, you do massage? I say, yes, I do massage. He says, well, I heard you're one of the best. He says, um, we're having a concert. Mm -hmm. It was a guy named George Clinton. Now, George Clinton, um, I never heard of him. Mm -hmm. But I did a little research and I found out, oh, George Clinton, he's supposedly the king of funk. No. The king of funk. So the king of funk is coming in and he wants me to give him a massage. So I just did a little research on him. And, um, and he had this quote, this amazing quote. Because obviously, you know, he's a star, you know, he's well known in his circle. Sure. And he talked a little bit about ego. And he says, yeah, ego. He says, yeah, he says, we wouldn't be doing this shit if we didn't have an ego. <laughs> Quite right. <laughs> you know, yeah, we wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> you know, we just wouldn't be doing it if we had it. If we didn't have the ego, we would be teaching. Right. We, we would just be in peace, meditating on the mountain somewhere, you know, we yes. care yes. about this. So oh, looking down. So, and it, and so, you know, the ego is something that really gets us out there, mm -hmm. you know, True. it's, it's all part of the process and it's a, it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. It's just that what you, what some people do with the ego, you know, like, like for instance, um, you could have a big ego and say, look, you know, I want to save the planet. Mm -hmm. you get out there and really do some amazing things, you know, the oh, ego. Yeah. Well, the sure. ego's all part of that. Yeah. So, you know, you know the ego says, hey, you know, I really want to connect in a spiritual way. I want to know, I, I want to connect. And, and so uh, it's that ego that gives that. And then it's, that's the trick, though, is that once you kind of get it, then you have to let go. It's that letting go of it. Yes. And, uh, I had a very, very interesting experience and I actually, uh, you, you might like this. Um, oh, I guess it's about five years ago or so. Um, now that I was in Brasilia and my uh, girlfriend at the time, uh, her son was playing Pokemon and we decided we'll go out and play Pokemon together. And we went out and there was this really nice Pokemon right, right over there. And so we went over there and it was in a, there was a little, little uh, temple there. Because I don't know if you know the game, but they put interesting things around interesting buildings and parks and stuff like that. So there's really interesting. So let's go in there. And we went in there. And when we went in, somebody walks up and they said, oh, you want to meet the master? And we said, Okay, sure, we'll meet the master, you know. So we went in, we had a nice chat, and there's this little Indian guy there. And, um, 
and you know, I've met a lot of spiritual teachers before. Yeah. And sometimes they're really hard to get to know, you know, they're very, you know, I'm too spiritual to really talk to you. This guy was just like a normal guy. We just, we had a good talk. And I started talking to him about this inner sound meditation. Mm -hmm. And he says, yeah, he says, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because that was the same meditation I did when I was in the pyramid. And I really didn't have a teacher for it. Is it Zura Chat Yoga? Well, I don't, what, I don't know that label for it. But okay. Th there would be kind of like, it, what it is, is you connect to this inner sound. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, this, and, um, and then you meditate on it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and there's probably different names, names for it. And he says, yes, he says, this is what I do. And I said, great. I said, and we sat down, we talked to it. I said, let's meditate together. We meditated a little bit with it. And um, it really got my, my interest a little bit more because I had some amazing experiences with it. Um, listening to their sounds. I mean, you'd hear these flute sounds. You would hear uh, sounds of crickets. You'd hear these different sounds. And even the angels was this, like beautiful angel music you could tune into. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, so I said, I want to learn more. And so it, um, he says, well, um, come to India. And so um, we happened to have a retreat in India that year. And so I just went to visit him. We, my wife and I, we spent 10 days with him and we did the meditation. And basically it was very basic. You just sit, you listen, you listen, and he's very clear about how you listen, so forth. Um, basically you're not listening with your ears, but sure. in the beginning, you, um, you really don't know um, how to not listen with your ears. Um, had a good experience with it, but I said, you know, I really want to get this. Mm -hmm. It's like, I want the enlightenment, mm -hmm. you know? Now, a lot of us, we've had what I call enlightened experiences. I mean, I've had them, I'm sure you've had enlightened experiences. Mm -hmm. I said, look, I really want the kind of the, the permanent one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He says, well, if that's what you want, then you've got to come and do the 40 days. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. Now the 40 day meditation, he just said, it's 21 hours a day meditation, three hours sleep. Oh gosh. And you only have this, it's, it's kind of like, they call it Mata. But it's, it's like, you know, you have the curds in the way when you're making cheese and stuff like that. So it's only that watery part. You don't have the curds. So it's just the water and it's fermented. It's like a yogurty drink. Mm -hmm. And that's all you have for the 40 days. It's like drinking this kind of fermented water in a way. That's spiritual boot camp, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, am I going to be able to do this? not having food for 40 days. But I said, okay, I'm going to do it. And I went there. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing was, is that right before I started, my father died. Oh, okay. So I like made the schedule and everything. My father died. And I said, no, I've got to make a decision. Do I go home? Mm -hmm. um, I probably won't be able to schedule 40 days again for a while. Yeah. And, um, and he just comes and says, you make a decision, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then he said, I'm going to do it. They said, I feel like if I do the 40 days, I'll actually have a better connection with my dad. And sure enough, I did. And it's like he just appeared to me and talked to me. It's amazing, right in the middle of meditation. Wow. Um, but anyway, so this is where you might be interested. It goes back, and I know you've written a book on this, and I've been dying to talk to you about this. Okay? Mm -hmm. So he gives me this mantra, because to start it with, he does the mantra, and of course the mantras are all secret and everything. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you part of the mantra, and the, the part of the mantra had the word cream in it. Mm -hmm. Okay? And for those of you that are, you know, 
I know a little bit about the, the mantra. Srim is a very important symbol. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it, most of us know Om. But Harim, uh, it's kind of in a way you have Om, which represents the Shiva. Mm -hmm. And then Harim is the Shakti, mm -hmm. or Saraswati, the, the goddess. And then on Shivaratri, the two get together and they create life. Yeah, sure. That's the basics of it. Now, I'm not an expert on it. I don't pretend to be an expert, but this is basically the basics of what I was taught. And so this harem was really interesting. And so here I am, I'm meditating. And, and the idea was, is that you don't just say the mantra, you write the mantra. Oh. So you're writing the mantra in your mind while you're doing the meditation. And guess what that reminded me of? <laughs> Writing Reiki symbols. Sure. You know? Yeah. And it's like, well, wait a minute. And, I, and you know, I kind of got away from all the symbol stuff. You know, I, I noticed that the initiations and everything worked just fine without doing all the symbols. And I used more visualizations. Mm -hmm. So here I am kind of going back and I'm doing these writings and I'm drawing and he says, yeah, you continue writing it pretty soon. You'll start to see in your mind the writing. And oh my gosh, after about three days, 21 hours a day, for after three days, hardly any sleep, I was about ready to quit. It was difficult. I mean, that really. Yeah. Uh, and, and then it was kind of funny because I said, no, I can't quit. You know, this is where the ego comes in. Yes. It says, it says you can't quit. Here my here my wife is posting on Facebook. She's doing a countdown. Day 40, day 39. She's doing a countdown. So day 37, Patrick quits. <laughs> goes, no, no, I'm not gonna let that happen. So but it was interesting. Every time I wanted to quit, I had like this kind of like what you would call samadhi experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and I realized that that's really what it was all about, you know, just being so overloaded that you finally give up and you surrender. Yeah, that was the method. Yeah, and uh, and so I, I go into these amazing experiences, just being in a state of timelessness. Mm -hmm. But was but what was interesting about it is I never really understood what samadhi was. You know, I always thought that Samadhi was this big light experience connecting with the angels and that sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just that peace. Mm -hmm. Almost like going into the nothing. And um, so after kind of getting into that state, that wasn't permanent. But doing the sound meditation, uh, now India I thought would be kind of quiet. But India is not quiet. It's very loud. Dogs, bands. I happened to go during the wedding season, so they had bands playing outside all the time. Yeah, probably. And, and uh, finally, I told the master, I said, Look, I said, this is great, crazy, all this uh, noise. Um, I said, I really, uh, no one's going to come do this meditation because it's just too noisy. And, and he just kind of looked at me and he says, when you become a master of sound, this won't bother you anymore. And then that night, I got it. Mm -hmm. It was like this, usually, you know, sometimes you have the experience, it's like a column of light comes down, but this was like a column of sound. It was just like I connected to the sound and it's never gone away. Wow, wonderful. Thank you. And so I, I hear it all the time now. Mm -hmm. And so, and actually this is part of the meditation. So like right now, I'm talking to you mm -hmm. and I'm meditating at the, on the sound at the same time. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is how the meditation works. This is you're all the time meditating on the sound. So it's the first time I realized that uh, you can meditate and do all kinds of other things uh, at the same time. Uh, it's interesting because I taught meditation for 35 years and now I realize that I never even knew how to meditate. <laughs> oh, 
always talk. And probably with what I know now, and the next level of awakening, I'll look back and I'll say, you still didn't know. <laughs> but now, getting back to this harem. Okay, so after doing it over and over again, there's something familiar about this. And it's so connected to Reiki. So now you're familiar with the, you might say, the new Seiki symbol that came out from Japan. The, mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know how you pronounce it. Puri? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, the, 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 it's the symbol that, it, it's different from the Takata Reiki symbol. I never heard about that. Yes, you do. You wrote a whole book on it. Just a second. Just a, just a second. Uh, you mean the, 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 the Siddham symbol, Harim? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. But, but that, that is the predecessor. There is a special... Um, let's say, uh, habit in esoteric Buddhism in Japan. Yeah, yeah, that they, that they yeah. use a Siddham symbol and yeah. um, just reshape it a little bit and make a kind of uh, energy work symbol out of that. That's the yeah. post process how Seiki was made. Yes, yes, and you can see, you can see how um, the Seiki was formed from that symbol. Right, right. exactly. And it's like, wait a minute, this is starting to make sense now. Yes. <laughs> it's starting to make sense. You know, of course, mm -hmm. the Seiki that Takata taught was not a Sanskrit symbol. No. And in this one, knowing Sanskrit, is not really a Sanskrit symbol either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But let's see, I think we have it. Um, but this one, mm -hmm. Harim, is a Sanskrit symbol. Right. And so I could kind of see how the harem became this re, mm -hmm. you know, and then I guess as it went into Tibet and China and everything, this connection with the goddess, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, then flowed into the whole Reiki system. And they say that, um, you know, at least from Frank, with Frank's work, uh, uh, he was saying that even on the Asui family grave site, they have this symbol. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's kind of a, it's kind of used for protection. It's 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 used all over Japan on all the graves. You will find that symbol because it's a canon symbol, the goddess of endless love and uh, um, uh, compassion, and uh, uh, she she is invited to bring the dead one to the paradise of the Amida Buddha. Yeah. You know? Oh no. Now, what's her name again? Canon. Canon is Kuan Yin, is Tara. Kuan Yin. Is Kuan Yin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so it was rather interesting. It's like all of a sudden, you know, the Indian goddess, you know, whether it was Saraswati or um, um, Kali, um, that feminine principle then kind of moved along and then became Kuan Yin. Yeah. In a way, you know, there's this, this, this connection. And, yeah. and when I was in Taiwan last time, it was interesting. I started talking about this, and they said, "And uh, they said, oh, well, you know, Kuan Yin was actually man, it was masculine." And I'm like, "What?" And they said, "Yeah, if you look at the early, what happened is, is that Kuan Yin originally was masculine, but now it's presented feminine." They they say it's it it is. Uh, Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, you know, mm -hmm. but I think that two uh, two schools or two traditions have mixed uh, some centuries earlier. Yeah, yeah, it's like I, I now I haven't studied it. I know you've studied it a lot more than me, but I just thought it was fascinating the way. It's fascinating, absolutely. It, yes. It's just so fascinating. So anyway, here I am. Hmm. I'm receiving this initiation, the sound initiation, and I'm getting what is kind of you might say, almost like a root Reiki symbol. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, hey, this is where this started, you know? I mean, we, we, we know that it kind of came from India mm -hmm. in some ways, you know, that, that a lot of the Buddhist traditions anyway, the, the Buddhist traditions, you know, all came from India and they came through. And of course, when you get in Japan, they, they mix their own uh, work with it. But when you get, get down to it, you know, a lot of this really base stuff 
um, comes from this meditation. So here I am doing a 40 day meditation. And I'm thinking, well, now there's a story that Takata taught that um, uh, when, when Mikhail Su is meditating, he received these symbols. Mm -hmm. I disagree. I, it just in my opinion, just from my experience in India, he was given certain symbols to do this meditation. Right. Yeah. And it, if it was anything like what I did, you sit there, you do the mantra, and you draw it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, you're doing that in your mind. That's the meditation that we're doing. And right. so it's kind of like, wow, this is all making sense now. Yes. It's just, it's like, but the thing was, Okay, after having kind of the 40 day meditation, having the experience, I have to think, all right. Here we have all these people teaching Reiki. Mm -hmm. And Mikawa Sui, really the basis of Reiki, came from his meditation. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Um, sure. And more than likely was also passed down to him from his teacher. Yeah. You know, and his teacher to his teacher. You know, there's probably this lineage that was passed down, but he didn't really include that. He didn't stress that. Mm -hmm. um, because in a way, I think when you have this awakening experience, it feels very unique to you. Mm -hmm. It does, yeah. It's like, wow, I got it. Mm -hmm. And I really don't need to have the lineage now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a direct connection. Mm -hmm. And so this is how he taught the Reiki. Mm -hmm at the time and again i haven't done enough research on it but um this was just my experience that i had in india with it and it's amazing you know that um, we do that so one of the things that i'm recommending now <laughs> do the meditation yeah really if you haven't done now he, he uh, uh so he did a 21 day mm -hmm. we do 40 days mm -hmm. And the reason we do the 40 days is it's like, um, now we know the story with the story where they supposedly took 21 stones and he went up and every day he threw a stone over his shoulder and so forth. We don't know how true it is, but anyway, he did supposedly throughout 21 days, you know? So we've had people come for the 40 day meditation um, and they'll have your experience. You'll have that big experience usually between 20 and 30 days. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So imagine if you're only doing 21 days and you actually need 22 or 23 days. That would be very sad. Yeah, you know, so it's like, hey, you just do it. Just do it. You really do the 40 days. Now, we know Buddha did something like 47 days when he got his alignment. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not sure, but I think it's 47 days. Yeah. Um, but the thing was is that Buddha really didn't have a teacher. Mm -hmm. So he probably spent the first few days trying to figure it out. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so if you have a, if you have a good teacher, you can shorten the time a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. But this is very important—a very important aspect that um, I do feel is not stressed enough with many of the people that are teaching Reiki. Mm -hmm. um, I know that some of you, you guys, you know, teach the, you know, really teach the meditations and. Yes, we do. Um, um, I know uh, Fred Stein. I, you know, I know him for pretty well. And, He's actually gone and done some in-depth uh, meditations in India, not India, but uh, Japan. Um, I do feel that this is a very, very important part uh, mm -hmm. for Reiki. You know, mm -hmm. if you're going to teach Reiki, learn how to meditate. Mm -hmm. Yes, meditation is is, uh, is a central thing. That that's right, and uh, uh, to uh, to meditate uh, in a way that there are really um, results, that the meditation process really works is um, uh, requiring a lot of teaching effort usually because people expect things from meditation which are which won't happen you know yes, they, don't, yes. they don't expect that they shouldn't expect you know so <laughs> and then a lot of this stuff mm -hmm. the the stuff that you're expecting to happen mm -hmm. is actually a distraction from the meditation absolutely yes yes it's like uh, and really this was new for me you know i didn't really this you know it's like uh, when you get into the soul level uh, you're not going to have any of your senses your, your physical yeah. senses 
Right. And, and what happens is, is that um, like the best, well, the best example is, is that when we dream, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when we're dream, we're kind of getting into this deep meditation experience. Mm -hmm. But as you get into it, what happens? Mm -hmm. We dream. Mm -hmm. And then we start seeing, uh, we start seeing things that, um, you know, just like this world. Mm -hmm. Like I might have a dream, I see, recognize somebody there, you know, like I had a dream about Donald Trump the other day, you know, um, <laughs> you know, you see cities, you see forests, you see everything like you normally see in this world. Yes. But yes, why is that? Mm -hmm. It's, it's because of the, you might say because of the programming, we're, we're used to using these senses. Mm -hmm. And when you get into the soul law level, you don't have that. Mm -hmm. And so really, like if, if, if um, ascended masters show up or this type of thing, this is all working with your senses. You kind of make, you might say your, your spiritual senses, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but those spiritual senses are not really part of the Samadhi experience. Right. What you want to do is separate yourself from that experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and realize that that's, that's not like, for instance, you know, on a soul level, I, I'm not this physical body. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not this emotional body. I'm not this mental body. And there is a point where you can actually say, if you're out of your body, you can see your body and you know, okay, I exist without that body. And then there's a cool thing that happens with the Samadhi is, is that you can actually see your mind and see your thoughts and watch your thoughts. And it's like, well, I'm really not these thoughts either. <laughs> Shocking, shocking. <laughs> it's just shocking. Yeah, it is. It's like, wow. And, and really, in a way, that's part of the awakening. Right, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for explaining this so well. I think this will help a lot of people to, uh, to understand better about this whole process. Yeah, well, I mean, really, that's a, this is the time. Especially now, you know, now that there's so much stuff going on with the politics and the virus thing, you know, people get into so much, um, a lot of people are living in so much fear now of this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uncertainty. Yeah. And, and really, once you realize that you're not really, this is not what you are, then you can just have a good time and enjoy it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Enjoy your time here, you know? You don't have to walk around in fear because, you know, you're an eternal being. Right. Have fun. <laughs> have fun. Enjoy, yeah. That's why you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Patrick. That was very uplifting and, and um, enlightening. And I hope that we will have a part two of that interview. Uh, oh, Go deeper into stuff if you like to do that, you know, I would be very happy. So for the moment, we will just say goodbye to the people listening, but we will come back. Yeah, yeah, no, really great to meet you. Wonderful. So all love, all love, bye-bye. <laughs>